So, we are getting the equation for heat exchanger here and if we see the control volume which we have drawn taking both the liquids together. So, there is no work interaction with the surroundings. We can put this particular term equal to 0. Again, if we consider this control volume, there is heat exchange between these two fluids, but that is taking place inside the control volume and <coughs> the control surface which is given by this pink line, it can be assumed to be well insulated. What is meant by that, that heat interaction of the control volume with the surrounding that is 0 or that can be neglected from the final expression. So, we can neglect it. In a heat exchanger, the changes in kinetic energy and potential energy, those are also neglected. So, all the kinetic energy and potential energy terms are neglected. Then finally, one can get H I 1 minus H E 1 that is equal to plus H I 2 minus H E 2 this is equal to 0. So, obviously, what will happen? One fluid will gain enthalpy and another fluid will lose enthalpy and that is what is coming out from this final expression for the heat exchanger example. So, <coughs> here I just like to recapitulate a few, a few points once again and then I want to move to another topic. What we have done that we have started from the expression of first law of thermodynamics which has been derived for a closed system, then we have extended it to open system. For the open system, we had a new terminology that is flow energy or flow work. Whenever any fluid mass consider, I mean it crosses a control surface, there is some amount of extra work done by that fluid mass. So, when it is entering the control surface, it is carrying this extra amount of energy into the control volume and when it is leaving the control volume, it is carrying that amount of extra energy from the control volume and taking it to the surrounding. And the expression of the flow work that is small p into small v, where p is the pressure at the control surface and V is the specific volume that gives the flow energy or flow work per unit mass. So, taking this quantity, one can write the steady state steady flow energy equation. Then we have seen the application of steady state steady flow energy equation for different devices like pump, turbine, compressor, etcetera. In all the examples, we have seen that certain terms can be neglected and here the designer or the operator or whoever is analyzing the problem, he has to use his own judgment or he has to go very carefully through the specification which is given for. Initially, we have done dynamics for an open system, but we can now extend it for multiple inlet and multiple outlet. We have taken a specific example, which is the example for a heat exchanger, where there are two inlets and two outlets. So, if the number of inlets and outlets are more than two, we have written the generalized expression. With that generalized expression, we can analyze those situations. So, with this, we can go to the new topic or the next topic. In the next topic, we like to see what are the limitations of first law of thermodynamics.
So, first law of thermodynamics basically it is law of conservation of energy and if we want to describe this law it is some sort of a bookkeeping law. It gives the account of the amount of energy and particularly <coughs> there is conversion of energy, conversion of uh, energy from one form to another form. The total amount remains constant, but to <coughs> but to see how much of a, a particular form is transformed into another form of energy, our first law of thermodynamics is utilized, utilized or useful. But there are certain questions or certain issues regarding energy transformation which the first law of thermodynamics fails to state. What are those issues? First issue is direction of heat transfer. We know that there is a general tendency for heat transfer to take place from high temperature body to low temperature body. But in first law, there is no hints about this preferred direction of heat transfer. Then second issue is mutual transformation of work and heat. If we remember the statement of first law, it says that when a body executes a cycle, the cyclic integral of heat transfer is equal to cyclic integral of work transfer. That means, if somebody tries to visualize some sort of a device where the <coughs> whole amount of heat can be converted into work, first law does not pose any sort of restriction to this postulation. But from our day to day experience, we know that though work can be totally converted into heat, heat cannot be totally converted into work. So, this is not stated by first law. So, this is one sort of limitation or one sort of incompleteness of first law that we do not get this information from first law. Thirdly, the rate of heat transfer. From first law, though we, we get the idea of total amount of heat transfer, but at what rate the heat transfer will take place, we do not get any idea. So, though first law is very important as far as transformation or conversion of energy is concerned, but there are certain is issues where first law does not give any sort of information. To supplement this, we have got second law of thermodynamics. Now, of course, whatever I have listed here, not, not that all the issues are tackled by second law of thermodynamics, but second law of thermodynamics gives certain information which supplements first law to a very great extent. Particularly, we will see these first two topics. Regarding them, we get information in second law of thermodynamics. So, now we move to the discussion of second law of thermodynamics. Before doing that, I like to discuss two very important devices which, which are used in engineering very extensively and not only that, I mean knowledge regarding those devices are also important for under, understanding second law of thermodynamics. These two devices are heat engines and refrigerator. So, let us first start with a heat engine. Heat engine is a device which operates in a cycle 
So, this operates in a cycle, takes heat from a high temperature reservoir. So, let us say this is taking Q1 amount of heat and this high temperature reservoir is kept at a constant temperature T1, converts part of it into work W and then rejects the rest which is Q2 to a low temperature reservoir. So, this is the schematic representation of a heat engine and from first law what we can write? We can write Q1 minus Q2 that is equal to W. Here there is flow of heat from the high temperature reservoir which is kept at temperature T1 through this heat engine to the low temperature reservoir which is kept at a temperature T2 and T1 is greater than T2 and this device this operates in a cycle. So, basically one can think of different devices which can be termed as heat engine. Let us say one internal combustion engine that can be termed as a heat engine, <coughs> one steam power plant that also can be termed as a heat engine. If we take the example of a steam power plant, so we have got let us say high temperature source which is supplying heat to the boiler, then we have got a low temperature sink which is our atmosphere where the cycle is rejecting heat and then there is a net work done which is turbine work minus the pump work. So, the steam power plant that is a that is operating in a heat engine cycle or as a whole the steam power plant can be termed as a heat engine cycle. Then <coughs> we can think of a device which is just reverse in arrangement to this heat engine cycle. Here also we are having two reservoir, this is a high temperature reservoir, high temperature reservoir kept at a temperature T1, this is low temperature reservoir kept at a temperature T2 and a cyclic device is operating between these two but the direction of flow of heat is just the reverse so this is taking some q2 dash amount of heat from here and it is supplying q1 dash amount of heat to the high temperature reservoir while this device needs certain amount of work to be supplied from outside and which is W done. Again one can write down first law of thermodynamics for this device. We can write Q1 dash is equal to W dash plus Q2 dash or Q1 dash minus Q2 dash is equal to W dash and in this case also T1 is greater than T2. This device it can be termed either as a refrigerator or a heat pump. depending on 
what we want this device to do or what is the end use of this device. Now, <coughs> this device can be looked as a refrigerator and in that case what we are doing? We are supplying certain amount of work from outside and we are always extracting certain amount of heat from this low temperature so sink so that its temperature can be maintained at T2 and ultimately that heat is being deposited or given to a high temperature source which is maintained at T1. So, if we are interested of <coughs> extracting certain amount of heat from this low temperature reservoir, then we call it a <coughs> refrigerator. But the use could be, the practical use could be such that we are interested to pump certain amount of heat to the high temperature source from this low temperature reservoir and in that case also we need certain amount of external work to run this device and in that case we will call this device to as a heat pump. So, either this can be seen as a refrigerator if we extract heat from low temperature source or it can be seen as a heat pump if we are pumping heat to the high temperature source. <coughs> if we compare between heat pump sorry heat engine and refrigerator, we can see that there are lot of similarities. So, in both these cases we need a high temperature reservoir or a source, a low temperature reservoir or a sink and a cyclic device <coughs> and there is work interaction with the surrounding. The only difference is the direction of heat transfer is reversed in these two cases and direction of work transfer is also reversed in these two cases. Now, <coughs> we define certain merit of these devices like in case of heat engine, we define the efficiency of heat engine. In general, <coughs> efficiency is output divided by the input. We know in engineering sense, this is the definition of efficiency. And in case of heat engine also, there is <coughs> the same methodology is followed. And <coughs> in heat engine, what is our output? Our output, what we are doing in heat engine, we are using thermal energy for creation or for conversion, for its conversion into mechanical work. So, mechanical work or the work done, that is the output we can put W and for that we have to put certain amount of thermal energy which is equal to Q 1. So, this is our efficiency of heat engine. Eta heat engine is W divided by Q 1. If we apply first law of thermodynamics, we can write this is Q 1 minus Q 2 divided by Q 1. And after simplification, one can write Q1 minus Q2 by Q1. So, this is the efficiency of the heat engine. In case of refrigerator or heat pump, instead of efficiency, we introduce another term which we call coefficient of performance or COP. So, we have COP coefficient 
of performance. So, this is defined as desired effect produced divided by energy supplied. As the desired effect produced are different in refrigerator and in heat pump, we will have different expression for COP in these two devices. So, <coughs> first let us write down, let us see the device. So, this is our refrigerator or heat pump. Here in this device, the external energy supplied is in the form of work or W dashed. All right. The desired effect produced are different in case of refrigerator and in case of heat pump. In case of refrigerator, we want to keep the low temperature source at a temperature T 2. For that, we have to extract certain amount of heat. We have to extract Q 2 dash amount of heat. So, this Q 2 dash is our desired effect produced. Where in case of heat pump, we want to pump certain amount of heat to the high temperature reservoir. So, Q 1 dash is the desired effect produced. So, accordingly, I will write COP refrigeration cycle that will be W dash and Q 2 dash is our desired effect produced. We can write Q 2 dash Q 1 dash minus Q 2 dash. COP heat pump we can write Q 1 dash is the desired effect produced and energy supplied from outside that is W dash or we can write Q 1 dash Q 1 dash minus Q 2 dash. So, these are the two expressions for our COP of a refrigeration cycle and a heat pump cycle. <coughs> now, with this background of refrigeration cycle and heat pump cycle, we can go for our second law and we can give the formal statement of second law. Now, one thing I like to mention that second law of thermodynamics, for second law of thermodynamics, there are different statements. But all these statements, if we analyze bit carefully, we will see that they <coughs> mention to the same phenomenon or same physical law of universe. So, all these statements, they have the same meaning. For engineering thermodynamics, we have got two very important or classical statements for second law of thermodynamics. So, these statements I will write down for you and we will see that both of them, they mean the same thing. The first statement is like this. statements of second law of thermodynamics. The first statement it states, it is 
impossible to construct a heat engine which will operate in a cycle and will transfer heat only with a single reservoir. So, I will read it once again. It is impossible to construct a heat engine which will operate in a cycle and will transfer heat only with a single reservoir. Here a few important points are there. Heat engine which will operate in a cycle and will transfer heat only with a single reservoir. So, what is stated by the first statement of first statement of second law of thermodynamics is like this. We know heat engine is a device which converts thermal en energy into work. So, <coughs> what the second law is stating is like this. Let us say we have got a thermal reservoir which is at a temperature T1 and we are having a cyclic device which is converting thermal energy into work. So, let us say this is Q1 and this is W. So, second law of thermodynamics says that this is impossible. Then what is possible? Possible is this one that it is transferring heat, exchanging heat with two different reservoirs which are at different temperatures. That means, when we have got two reservoirs at two different temperatures, then only when there is a heat flow from one reservoir to another reservoir, only then we can convert part of the thermal energy into work. Or if we put it in another word, it is like this, you cannot convert the full amount of thermal energy obtained from a reservoir solely into work, only part of it you can convert into work and the rest of it you have to deposit or give to another reservoir. Or if we like to state the second law of thermodynamics in terms of efficiency, we know efficiency of heat engine is like this. 1 minus q 2 minus sorry q 2 by q 1, where q 2 is the heat rejected to the second reservoir. This q 2 you can never make it into 0 or you can never have 100 percent efficiency of the heat engine. So, this is what is said by or stated by the first statement of second law of thermodynamics that if you want to convert thermal energy into mechanical work by a cyclic device which is very important, then part of the thermal energy you have to leave or you have to give off to a low temperature body and rest of it you can convert into mechanical work. Then let us go to the second statement of 
second statement is like this. It is impossible to construct a device which will operate in a cycle and will produce and will produce no effect other than transfer of heat from a low temperature body to a high temperature one. So, here also a few important words are there that first thing it is talking of a device which will operate in a cycle. So, in both the cases we see that cyclic operation that is very important or continuous operation that is very important and will produce no effect other than this is very important. This is another important phrase transfer of heat from a low temperature body to a high temperature one. So, these are the important points that it is talking of a device which will operate in a cycle and will produce no effect other than transfer of heat from a low temperature body to a high temperature one. So, just like the previous case let us try to make a sketch of it that we have got two bodies at different temperatures. This is at temperature T 1 and this is at temperature T 2. So, T 1 is greater than T 2. Then we have got some device which is operating in, in a cycle and it is transferring heat in this direction. So, here it is Q 2 and here also it has to be q2 sorry q2 but second law says that this is impossible then what is possible that you cannot do it like this you have to have some other effect which could be in the form of supply of external work let's say this is w so this has to be also changed this is q1 q1 which is nothing but q2 plus w <coughs> we can write applying first law of thermodynamics q1 plus sorry q2 plus w that is equal to q1 and that is what has been written here also. So, <clears throat> we know from our day to day experience that heat flows from a high temperature body to a low temperature body and this is again restated in our second law of thermodynamics that the general tendency of heat flow is from high temperature to low temperature. You can make heat flow from a high temperature from a low temperature body to high temperature body by a cyclic device only when 
you have some other external effect like the supply of work from some external agency. And obviously, this device which is operating in a cycle and we have seen it's <coughs> it is known as a refrigerator or a heat pump depending on what is your end use. Again, this particular statement can be restated in terms of COP. How can we state it in terms of COP? If we see the expression of COP, we had the expression of COP like this. The first one is the COP of a refrigerator, the second one is the COP of a heat pump. Now, we have seen in this example that this external work W, this can be only a finite quantity, finite positive quantity, it can never be 0. So, in terms of COP, we can say that COP of refrigerator or heat pump, it can never be infinity. If W is not equal to 0 from our second law, then the COP R or COP HP heat pump, they can never be infinity. So, <coughs> we have seen the two classical statement of second law of thermodynamics and it can be shown that violation of one statement means the violation of other statement also. <laughs> the proof of this particular thing that means the violation of one statement is the violation of other statement that is not very difficult, it is easy and it is given in any standard textbook of thermodynamics, but I think for the present course we are not going to do it due to lack of time. One can see it from any standard book of thermodynamics and one can take it that as the violation of one statement gives the violation of other statement. So, these two statements are identical and they are meaning the same physical law for the universe. Now, <coughs> once we know that we cannot construct a heat engine which will have infinite amount of or which will, we cannot construct a heat engine which will have efficiency equal to 1 which is the highest achievable efficiency. Then the next question comes to our mind that what best we can construct? What could be the maximum possible efficiency that we can achieve from a heat engine? So, that is the very logical question and this question is of engineering interest also. So, now let us try to see what is the, what is the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine. Similarly, one can argue in the same line, we have seen that second law puts a restriction to the <coughs> COP value of a refrigeration cycle or a heat pump cycle. We have seen that we cannot have infinite coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle or for a heat pump cycle. So, one can logically put one question, okay, the COP of these devices will not be infinity, but what maximum value of COP we can have for a refrigeration cycle or for a heat pump cycle. Now, again <coughs> from observations, the scientists have seen that maximum possible efficiency can be achieved from a heat engine, maximum possible efficiency 
of heat engines can be obtained if the heat engine cycle is a reversible cycle. What is a reversible cycle? If all the processes of the cycle are reversible processes, then we call it a reversible cycle. So, all the processes are reversible. Now, now, next question comes, what is a reversible process? So, what is a reversible process? A reversible process, if we want to understand, so let us take any example, let us say this is a thermodynamic plane and we have got two state points, state point 1 and this is state point 1 and this is state point 2 on this thermodynamic plane. So, we can have any arbitrary process between state point 1 and state point 2. If it is a reversible process, then we can have, we can go from state point 2 to state point 1 or we can reverse the process and by doing so, there will not be any change either in the system or in the surrounding. So, then only we will call the process to be a reversible process if by reversing it, we do not produce any change either in the system or in the surrounding. We have started from state 1, we have gone to the state 2 by the forward process. If we can come back to state 1 without producing any net change in the system and in the surrounding, then we will call that 1 to 2 is a reversible process. All right. But one has to remember that no natural processes are reversible process. Okay. Whatever small it may be, there will be some change left either in the system or in the surrounding. But there are certain processes which are highly irreversible process or there are certain effects which are highly irreversible and that makes the process a highly reversible process. If those effects are there in your heat engine cycle or in the heat pump cycle, obviously the efficiency or the COP of those cycles will be low. So, let us try to identify what are those, what are the causes of these irreversibilities. causes of irreversibility. <coughs> there are number of causes of irreversibility. I, I cannot list all of them or we cannot discuss all of them, but some of them which are very important, we will discuss it here and we will see <coughs> not, on, not only from our day to day experience, but also in this discussion which we will follow that when these causes are there then the cycle efficiency will be lower. So, first one is
heat transfer across a finite temperature difference. Heat transfer across a finite temperature difference. Well, let us take some example that if there are two bodies and this body is in temperature T1 and this body is in temperature T2, if they are thermally insulated then there will not be any heat transfer, but if the thermal insulation between these two bodies are removed then there will be heat transfer and if T1 is greater than T2 then heat transfer will be there from the high temperature body to this low temperature body. The heat transfer will continue till the bodies assume some thermal equilibrium or they have the same temperature, but this process is a highly irreversible process. If we have to bring, bring back the initial condition that means after this heat transfer process we have got these two bodies both are at temperature T. Now if I have to bring back let us say this is our state 1, this is our state 2. If I have to bring back again to state 1 from this state 2, then what we have to do? We have to put some sort of a heat pump in between them. Okay. This heat pump now what it can do? Both of them are at same temperature, but the heat pump let us say we can do it like this. There is a heat pump HP and it will take heat from this body and it will pump to the first body. But for running this heat pump what I have to do? I have to supply some work from outside. So, it is not impossible to go back to state 1, we can go back to state 1. So, system will be brought to its initial state, but what about the surrounding? The surrounding from the surrounding we have taken some amount of work for running the heat pump, Still, there will be certain change in the surrounding. So, obviously the heat transfer across a finite temperature difference that is a <coughs> process which causes irreversibility. And in our cycle, if we have such type of a process, definitely we will have a low efficiency of the cycle. Then mixing, mixing of two materials that is again an irreversible process. Okay. Like if we take the example that there are two different species of gas kept in two compartments. Let us say this is oxygen and this is nitrogen and this is a mixing process. So, they are partitioned. Now, if I remove the partition due to diffusion process, oxygen molecule will diffuse into nitrogen and nitrogen molecule will diffuse into oxygen and this process will continue un, uh, until we get some sort of a homogeneous mixture. Once we get the homogeneous mixture, if we want to bring back to this condition, so what we have to have? Some sort of a device which can pump or which can separate the oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules and obviously we need certain energy input from outside and there will be certain change in the surrounding if we want to bring back the system in its initial condition. So, obviously we will have a 
irreversible process if we allow mixing between oxygen and nitrogen. I think we will stop here and we will take other examples in our next class and we will see what are the other different causes for irreversibility. Thank you.